Hi, welcome back to Future Fast. And like always, we have a very interesting guest today. And before I introduce you to him, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, Future Fast is an effort to bring people who are doing things that are bound to have an impact on the future. And the whole idea of these conversations are that can we draw some pointers, some tips that could potentially be used by any of us in our own businesses or life. And uh, apart from that, I hope you are enjoying the conversations that uh, with uh, very different uh, backgrounds that we are bringing in, and uh, also most importantly, also the kind of predictions they are making. And I hope you are checking on those as well. And uh, coming to today's uh, guest, we have Daniel Rupnarai. Daniel is a serial entrepreneur, and uh, he's come from a Web 2.0 space, and today. He is transitioning to Web 3.0, and he's also the Metaverse consultant, and he's doing some amazing work. What he's doing, we will hear it from him. And uh, for that, let's just dive in, and uh, you guys enjoy the ride. Daniel, welcome to Future Fast, and thank you so much for making time to be here. Oh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to uh, talk about the Metaverse. I appreciate it. Wonderful. So, uh, Daniel, can you... Can you start with your journey? I mean, that, that's where we start because uh, I, mm. I believe that it's good to understand your journey so that we have a better perspective of uh, what you talk about today and the future so that you know your journey is understood better by us. Yeah. Um, so my journey started, I guess, back in 1995 with Front Page and Dreamweaver uh, creating my first web page. Okay and um, getting the attention of the corporation I was working with. So that corporation actually had um, locations around the world. And I created a web page for our Canadian branch, got the attention of the corporate branch uh, because no other, including them, didn't have a website yet. And uh, I kind of got in trouble because I put something out there that they didn't uh, know about. Uh, yeah. But then they flew me to Germany and asked me oh, a whole bunch of questions. And uh, next thing you know, there's corporate websites. And uh, so that was my first experience of um, getting on the web. I then uh, didn't want to work for anybody. Uh, and <laughs> so I decided to create a, uh, a multimedia martial arts website. And what it included, it was called Martial Vision. And what I did was I walked around to different martial arts studios, videotaped the instructors and created a, what you would think about like YouTube. Um, and you would be able to come to the website. It was built in cold fusion. So it was database driven. And we had Tai Chi, Sambo, Jiu Jitsu, Judo, Karate. And you were able to go in and, and find different videos and this is way before any of the other stuff happened. Um, I actually had to go to the bank uh, and explain what payment online was because no one knew what that was. I put a lot of money into that, um, a lot of money into that. And uh, <laughs> one thing that I didn't uh, consider was my audience. And it was a really good lesson because for me, I had high speed. Um, you know, I understood the internet. I had a good computer, but my audience didn't. And so, uh, I had a free, uh, section and a paid section. This paid section was something like $5 a month to get access to it. And I had thousands of free people and no one paid cause they didn't know. Um, so my server costs were huge. <laughs> um again there's no youtube there's no vimeo oh, right. and, right. and uh so i'm like oh crap so that was my uh first real big dive into uh the internet uh i wound up getting a, a corporate job which, which year was that 97 98 
uh and uh yeah just before so the dot com bust well that was the problem the i was right into the dot com bust because i was looking for investors and i thought i had something but they looked at me and said well what's the population side size of the martial arts community uh, okay i understand it's not huge unless you're doing a, where were you, you know, doing it out of uh brampton ontario canada <laughs> okay okay so you you didn't consider moving to us or silicon valley or something i tried i tried um obviously in 97 you know there's no real linkedin there's no networking uh, it's basically who you know and being a web guy in a non web environment and talking about you know brampton canada a uh, small town even toronto which i'm just 40 minutes away from um wasn't huge uh in that space so i didn't have a lot of connections uh and it was a difficult time a really difficult time i i uh quit a really well paying job that i was the senior tech guy there and to go after my ambition because i believed in it uh as you and i had have talked about in our previous conversation you know ahead of our time you know we have this <laughs> vision and uh um, yeah. and we like well i i i can relate to what you're saying because i was pretty much in a similar situation around the same time but yeah. in a different part of the world <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, yeah you know so we were experiencing the same thing at the same time and and you know uh yeah so i wound up getting a corporate job based on uh the experience i had so you know all of a sudden i had the ability to say on my resume i built a media platform um project management which i went to school for and uh understood technology programming database servers uh marketing advertising all that stuff i was written up in magazines uh in the martial arts community so i understood how to make something work and i understood how to manage it in the background and that's really a key part of it because when you're doing a content management system it doesn't matter what it is it could be martial arts it could be um you know as uh, hockey or baseball or cricket doesn't matter what it is you have to have a management tool behind the scene and i had created that there was uh nothing out there at the time that i can just you know plug and play i had to build it in the back end so how do you manage members how do you manage payments how do you manage orders and returns how do you manage uploading content and comments and and all that stuff how do you integrate the shipping into it and so there was right. so much that i had to do without anyone teaching me because there was yeah. no course on it uh, this All is right. 1996 97 uh so that gave me the ability to uh work at another company and through that company um it went through ups and downs and dot com happened the bust and so i got laid off from there and i'm like okay because i was in the web area and so i just went off and one of the things that i realized was websites were in demand people wanted it but it was very expensive to do a good one in a way that allowed a business to manage it properly and that's key you know I set up a website and then I need something changed. Well, at that time a lot of time a lot of people were hiring a programmer to make the updates. And if that programmer wasn't around or they left or all of a sudden they're in limbo. So Joomla was was uh, popular, Mambo was popular, uh, Correct. and and I, I, so I hired I so, Yeah, uh, I I I've used Joomla as well. <laughs> Yeah. So that was kind of like the go-to um for guys like us content management and systems, yeah. And so I hired a programmer and I customized Mambo to be more user-friendly for a non-tech person where I stripped out things that they didn't need and only had add a web page, add an image um in a, in a better format. And then I would create these templates and sell them and it worked uh then 
e-commerce came around and, and I was looking at Zencart, I believe at the time. And okay. Xcart was just coming out. Uh, so we started doing uh, integration between the website builder and Zencart uh, so that you would have a complete one-stop shop. Because one of the things that I couldn't stand was I had to go from one third-party site or component to another third-party component. You would integrate that. And then a year later, uh, that plugin would no longer be available you know, there was a security update and so no longer be recognized. And then you had to switch from one place to another. So I got really frustrated with that. And I decided to invest more money that I didn't have uh, and build a, a content management tool for businesses. So what it was in today's uh, references was a Wix, a Weebly, GoDaddy combined with a Shopify uh, merged into a... Um, a marketplace like Amazon. So yeah. targeting the associations so that they can give members something that would have a website capability, something that would have a store cap capability, but also enable that association to take or leverage the number of members and um, put their own marketplace for that industry. Built that. Uh, in the meantime, one of my friends that I, I met asked me to help start up a business um, in the shipping area. Basically, it was um, rate shopping, UPS and Pure Later and FedEx. So you would get the best uh, rate for shipping a parcel because the, uh, the shipping companies had better rates in certain areas than the others. They weren't great in every area. Some were good in, you know, uh, out east. Some were good in rural areas out west. And so if you um, had an account with a uh, courier, you were stuck there. And so some of the rates might, might be higher than what other companies would, but you were stuck with them because you had an account with them. With the company that um, I helped co-found, it would rate shop, you would get a label printed up and um, you would get the best. Because we actually went to the couriers and said, look, we have... 5,000 users, would you like to have access to them? And then it went to 10,000 and 15, and then eventually up to 30,000 while I was still there, 30,000 businesses uh, who wanted to ship. So we got up to 30% discount on our rates with these couriers. We passed them along um, and kept, you know, five, maybe 7% on us. Mm -hmm. So we made uh, some good money. We went public and, uh, at that point in time, I was still building out my web builder, decided to sell my shares, move on. We had uh, kind of a conflict of interest because my web builder was uh, holding them back from making deals with other companies that had a much larger base. Mm -hmm. There was a company that, uh, and I, I won't mention any names, but it's a, a really four letter dot com name in the commerce wow. space. Uh, and I saw that the company we uh, partnered with owned that domain. They had owned it for like 16 years. They The guy bought it when it just came out. And I said, you own this domain name? And right now, no joke, it would be worth 10 to $15 million to sell just oh, yeah. the domain name itself. Uh, oh, yeah. And he's just sitting on it. So I said... <laughs> Come on, <laughs> let's do something with this. Um, so we wound up starting a, a whole new division of this uh, public company. Uh, took my ideas and then uh, literally took it. <laughs> so I left, sold my shares and started a company called Web Power Up, um, which is owned by uh, some more partners, Web by Smart Simple. And the idea basically is uh, you can set up a website Inside the website, you can manage your members and groups. So you, it's a membership uh, site. You can schedule appointments. You can uh, sell products. There is everything from newsletter component to being able to manage um, your your members' profiles in capacities where you have badges. So a lot of marketing tools, forms, so you can create your form. So I put SurveyMonkey, Monkey. 
type uh, modules. Everything is built from the ground up. So nothing was a third party. It was, okay, let's put a newsletter module in. Let's put a, a form builder module in. Let's put a membership module in. And we built it from the ground up. And uh, so now that's my platform that I have. Through that platform, I work with insurance companies. I work with Native American tribes that use that for their members. I work with a lot of associations, even in, uh, in the sports world, gymnastics, uh, dance, swimming, uh, because they don't really understand technology, but they have the same type of needs. And so when I position here is a platform that does all this and you don't have to go anywhere else, at that point in time, then they go, okay, uh, let's use it. Mm. So um, then over the years, um, blockchain, Bitcoin, Satoshi, you know, you start to follow everything. And and then I, I got to a point where I'm like, I need to uh, um, upgrade. I need to make sure that I'm part of this trend. And I'm fully aware we're five years maybe seven years out before, you know, this becomes something that is a lot more accepted and adopted. And when I say, I, I'm saying to the masses where your aunt, uncle, brother, sister, who's not in this space is using it. Um, so I'm always one to make sure that I'm ahead of the curve, making sure that I'm part of the pioneer group rather than just following uh, in this space. So I got involved uh, in learning a, a lot about it and then COVID happened and my clients were shutting down businesses. And I thought to myself, mm -hmm. I got to do something. Everyone was bypassing the local stores, the local um, businesses, going directly to Amazon, going directly to Walmart, shopping online. No one was walking down the streets anymore. So I thought, well, what can we do? I mean, <laughs> how do we get people to shop at these uh, small stores? So I thought about um, gamification and how it works, right? Everyone loves reward points. Everyone loves to get discounts. That's why we you know, have points to go traveling, point to get discount on gas or whatever the case might be. And during COVID, everyone was playing games. Um, whether it be solitaire or, or, you know, angry birds, I'm not a gamer. I have like solitaire and chess on my, on my phone, but I know that it's, it's, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. It, it, oh, yeah. So I get it. I get it. Um, so I thought to myself, well, if everyone's gaming, um, cause they're stuck at home, why don't they get rewarded for their time in the real world? So what if I went to communities and said, let's gamify your area where everyone agrees to participate in accepting points. And I'm going to create a platform where they can play online games. While they play online games, they get points. Those points can then be used on the platform that I have built with the marketplace. Bring your vendors in and you don't have to put your entire product line or inventory. Just put the products you're willing to accept discounts in. So maybe 5,000 points gives you $5 off a mug or, you know, 20,000 points gives you a t-shirt for free. But what it does is introduce your uh, yeah. store to the local population in that city. Oh, right. Right. It's kind of like, um, you know, how Groupon started, right? So Groupon started and in that capacity, people were buying Groupons, even if they didn't use it. So I would see a hot yoga Groupon uh, ticket for you know five sessions for the price of two and I would buy it go to one session and, and get too busy and and never show up again but it worked you know so you would you would uh, so we started doing that I, I built a whole platform based on gamification onboarding um, the local vendors but what it took was meet the community the local council to get the business community involved because knocking on doors they're it's very, very difficult. So you have to go to the entire association, the business community, right. and get them all on board at the same time. Um, and so while I was processing that, I was still looking at NFTs, looking at blockchain, understanding crypto. And 
uh, I have my own thoughts on it. Uh, if not necessarily right, but I'm very much of a meat and potato guy where, well, what can I do with this? Uh, right. And if you say, well, you can sell it to somebody else who wants it, that doesn't mean very much to me. I want to be able to use uh, token of commerce to buy something, to buy a service to, you know, in the real world, uh, or at the very least get a discount. And that's where the points came in. I didn't want yeah. to get involved with uh, uh, regulations and regulatory stuff. Well, with points, it's just, hey, I'm getting discounts. There's no con there's no currency being exchanged. It's safe. Mm -hmm. And it's something that everyone can get, get involved with. Um, and then, so I started talk talking to a, a friend who ran um, a Bitcoin mining company out in British Columbia, Canada, Canada, uh, environmentally friendly. So it was an old, uh, mill, um, paper factory that had a hydro plant running, um, through waterfalls, oh. so it was wow. clean energy. And so they were mining from there and came on board and said, look, you have a lot of opportunities in this space in your marketing, you're environmentally friendly, your Bitcoin, um, Long story short, they brought me on board and I started to do some of their marketing. And then I said, guys, you have a real big opportunity. You're in blockchain, you're in crypto. Um, the metaverse is something that you can really tap into. So what I did was I actually did a um, a demo. There's a uh, community yeah, in Toronto called... Sorry? When was this? This was, um, I guess, three years ago. Oh, okay. 2020. So 2020. Yeah. 2020, 2021. Yeah. Um, so I went and there's a, there's a, a district in Toronto called the distillery district, very popular kind of posh area. Um, a lot of uh, upscale type of stores and restaurants, uh, a nice place to go visit if you're a tourist. And even if you're, uh, if you're local, it's a good place to go and, and actually kind of visit and, see something different so uh, i hired a team of uh game developers and metaverse uh developers to say hey i want you to build a representation of this i took google maps showed them the area um took the pictures and we created a uh, a demo of an avatar walking around in the distillery district with these storefronts and you walked into a store and wow. there was clothing and everything uh Daniel, yeah. I'm just curious. Where did you hire the people from? Uh, I'm just curious uh, if you hired them from yeah. India. Okay. Yeah. Where, Hi Hi I mean, is, yeah. Is Actually, it okay to, from where? Where in India? Hybridat. Uh, Hybridat. Yeah. Is that it? That's how you pronounce it. Hybridat or Hyderabad. 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 Yeah. And uh, right. terrible pronunciations, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in with names and and everything no, no that's, um, that's okay but uh uh india has had uh, uh lit there been a small community of people who adopted uh blockchain quite early so now it's growing in fact uh, probably in some time india will become the major source of talent for blockchain for anywhere in the world oh i fully believe that uh as you know i was born in montreal my dad's from trinda my mom's from guyana spent my whole life in canada um, and when I go hire, I hire, uh, locally when I can, but when I offshore, I never look at where they're located. I, I look at, you know, their skill sets and half the time it's, it's in India and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, we're a Commonwealth country as well. So we have that in common Canada and India, um, right. and, uh, English is never a problem with the people I deal with. So right. it's, uh, it makes it easy uh, on that. So these guys I'm still working with, I uh, can't say enough about them. Um, fantastic, uh, you know, professionals and, and very young talent under 30. Yeah. Um, and so they created this um, instance and in, of the metaverse and what it is all about. And part of what I did was add what I call game cubes gamifications and it showed as an avatar walking around if you got a gamecube you got points and then you walked into a storefront but you had ten thousand points now you would get a uh, discount on the clothing line that they offered so the whole concept of gamification in retail in a 3d space well 
they showed that to some of their investors, uh, European bankers, and they just fell in love with it. Uh, the whole idea, the whole concept of gamifying cities and retailers. Um, so I spent, uh, they hired me on board as the chief metaverse officer to spearhead this. We brought on board urban planners. We did a whole concept to emulate what Sandbox and Decentraland did with land sales, and um, which I totally disagreed with, I'll be upfront. Uh, I, I think there's a place for that, but I don't believe in scarcity <laughs> on in the metaverse. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, I had many arguments on that space because uh, in my head, we're limiting the amount of people who can participate in um, part of the ecosystem. Imagine if Amazon only had 100,000 stores available. Uh, imagine if Facebook only said 1 million accounts and then people could sell their accounts. It would make no sense. I see the same thing in, um, in selling digital real estate. Really, there's no more space that we we have. It's <laughs> so we had, but anyways, the investors came on board and they they said, no, this is the way people are making money. And I said, okay, if it's about the money, then I guess we got to do it this way. Um, so we did that, and uh, crypto winter happened. You know what? You know all the uh, yeah yeah. You know, so we were smack dab in that as a Bitcoin mining company. Um, we lost a lot of the value. A lot of the investors lost a lot of their money and pulled out. Mm -hmm. So here I am again um, with no funding and no investment. But it's one of those things where I really believe in this. And um, yeah, I can go on and on. <laughs> so uh, tell me something. What's the core of your learning that is? help you, uh, you know, not only survive through different things all through your life, right? Starting back in 97 to uh, now as you get into the the thick of metaverse, we'll get into it when we talk about it in the further conversation. Yeah. But as you move, what is the core of your learning that has been, you think that is helping you go through and be, you know, I think uh, uh, be successful or even keep the head out because many people drown who <laughs> we'll get washed yeah. out. I think the core of it is um, if you give the right tools to your audience, the right um, uh, assets for them to succeed and be successful. So you make your clients successful and give them the uh, answer to the not, now what part of, you know, now that I'm in your storefront, now that I've bought your product, now that I've engaged in your service, now what? If you're able to give that um, to your customers, in my particular case, um, so, uh, then you have if value. I can reinterpret it. So basically what you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're coming to that. So you're basically offering the value to the customer you give, and yeah, help giving... them be relevant. Exactly. So I'm a B2B type environment. I don't really go to the end customer. I work with the businesses and help them understand technology in a way that allows them to succeed. Yeah. So in that capacity, I got to show them what their real value is in a digital sense. Yeah. You might be, let's just say a personal trainer. Fantastic. And you're on YouTube. Okay, great. There's 10,000 YouTube um, yoga instructions and weightlifting and how do you stand out? Well, you have to specialize in a very specific area. You have to be uh, diligent in your content. You have to uh, associate yourself with other professionals that recommend you. Uh, just a side tangent. So way back, uh, you know, in 95, 96, there was always these, uh, these mastermind and gurus. I remember when the newsletter came out and uh, banner ads and, 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 you know, the animated gifts and all that kind of stuff yeah. it was a like huge things, but there was always all these guys that were popping up saying, uh, pay me and I'm going to show you how to be successful. Cool. Well, the reality, the cool. reality, it was that it was a small group of guys. So let's just take, you know, five, six, um, guys, one was a graphic designer, one was a database guy, one was, you know, uh, a good talker, whatever the case might be. 
and they would spend six months in the first month for the guys would would hype the first guy up the guy would get a lot of members then the next month that guy and the other guys would hype the second guy up and until eventually you know the last guy would get all these credible um uh comments from these guys and also the they were professionals yeah. right. and so these mastermind groups were popping up everywhere and being in the industry i knew what what they were doing they weren't saying anything that was you know relevant or or incredible it was just a bunch of guys saying oh yeah i used this guy oh this guy is fantastic all right <laughs> so um the value came from the people talking about that Good. and so if i was to say you know what's the value of the podcast we're doing you know the value behind that is you're introducing an individual a concept a um an idea to people who never would have stumbled upon myself you know or any of your other guests and in that capacity you're associating yourself with so many um i'm going to say leaders in specific areas that now you become a leader how did oprah winfrey become so popular popular she just talked <laughs> right brought on a bunch of guests and all of a sudden she was the go-to person right um Good. and so when you associate yourself with the right people and you highlight that and you promote yourself and you show value to what you bring well very interesting daniel i i didn't really think about it that way so now i need to think about becoming a problem free <laughs> you know I, and uh I'm being yeah. very serious about that where no uh, um, yeah I, I I get you I mean I, I never thought about it in that way at all yep uh because now your resource and I'm just gonna cite that your resource what you're doing right now is you know people in very specific areas so if I had a question and in, in let's just say um in banking and and uh crypto and you just did an interview with an expert in that area I can now ask you on on your LinkedIn or on YouTube feed or your podcast. I'm about to enter in this area. Any suggestion? Yeah, let me introduce you to this person. All of a sudden, that becomes that connection, that networking, that credibility. Um, and I'll probably tap into that. The influencers in the world don't have a lot of credibility. That's why when you say, when an influencer, influencer goes into a restaurant and say, I have, you know, 50,000 followers, the restaurant goes, okay, no problem. Still pay their tab and, and send them my way. They don't have any yeah. credibility. So the value behind what you're doing is you're getting a lot of credibility because of the people you're selecting have done stuff, you know, and have shown, you know, that they walk the walk, talk the talk and make things happen. Yeah. You know, I, I tell my kids, um, you know, throughout history, doesn't matter what race, what religion, what, you know, country they have been in, the one thing that is um, part of every successful endeavor, whether you're uh, a politician, uh, a religious leader, uh, a business person, is they took action. Action is the key part of success. You can talk all you want. You can write policies, you can write regulations, you can do a lot of, you know, speeches, but it's the action. You know, if I'm hungry and I go in the kitchen, I can read the recipe, but I actually have to cook to feed myself. Yeah. So the value comes in showing a business where the value is and how to take that value and create action behind that. Mm -hmm. And that now becomes something that's sustainable in a business. So, so, uh, so very true. In fact, I always uh, tell in some instances that uh, what makes an idea great is its actionability. Exactly. If, if, if the idea is not actionable, but it's like mind blowing, but I can't action it, then it's, it's not a great idea. So exactly. I think, uh, yeah. Very, very well put. Thank you. And, uh, uh, how, how do you see the, uh, uh, you know, uh, what you're doing now, right? And uh, uh, various things, 
uh, particularly and also in the metaverse space. How do you see these things help you succeed in future? Um, so we're very we're at a pivotal point right now in the metaverse where um, a lot of companies are starting up their own platforms and let's uh, define metaverse. Uh, so there's Please. metaverse and metaverse platforms. The metaverse is really um, the next generation of the internet. Just like how we started with land lines, then we went to pagers, blackberries came out and some guy said, hey, people want to do more with the phone. So an iPhone came out. The metaverse is just another stage of the internet. The uh, Where we're at right now is a lot of individual companies trying to put their mark. And what's happening is we're getting a situation where uh, the end user, the average person is very confused. They don't know what the metaverse is because Facebook changed their name to meta. They think meta is, is now the metaverse, which they're not. Um, they they hear about Sandbox, CryptoKitty, Decentraland, Somni Space. Are these the metaverse? They're the metaverse. They are metaverse platforms akin to websites. So you have the World Wide Web, which is now trans transitioning to the metaverse. You have metaverse platforms, which are are kind of like websites. And we really need, as an industry, as people in the space to kind of take a step back and say, we should work together because what's happening right now is everyone has to download a metaverse platform or engage in a very um, a different type of registration for each experience. And it, that's like, imagine the internet starting up where everyone had to download a different browser to access <laughs> every website. Only the most popular websites would be around right now, and no one else would be able to have the ability to start up their own company because you wouldn't know about it. Right. That's the danger um, that we have right now. So uh, I am part of the World Metaverse Council, uh, which is a fantastic organization organization with people around the world. And I, I legitimately means around the world. Um, we have business business people we have doctorates uh, uh ex-government um just the who's who in this world um working together to create as I mentioned policies and regulations but also create that interoperable type of um engagement so that's where i'm at right now they've asked me to spearhead the interoperable work group and what we're doing is with my team uh, we're creating a World Metaverse campus and using that campus as the template, we are working with other um, platforms to connect it. So we're actually, like I said, cooking in the kitchen rather than, sure, you know. Sure, I, I I want to dig deeper on that on our next conversation. Sure. So, uh, uh, Daniel, uh, do, you, uh, do you want to recall some people or uh, uh, or institution, if you will, who have influenced and made you the person that you are today? Do you want to? Um, well, no doubt my parents. You know, I, I can't think of anyone who hasn't had their parents, uh, you know, good or bad, because you can learn, you know, from the good and bad of people. So definitely parents. Um, very fortunate that I had supporting parents. Uh, my wife, <laughs> you know, she's the complete opposite to me. I'm, uh, she's so caring and loving and, and easygoing and I'm, uh, a workaholic and disciplined and, and just, you know, go, go, go. So she really, uh, makes me live. Um, my, uh, my martial art instructor, I've been, uh, in the martial arts for over 35 years um with the same instructor and wow. uh it just goes to show it's it's one of those he's he's more than an, an instructor he's a mentor and uh he does more than walk the walk so i very much am a kind of guy that uh actions speak louder than words and if you uh do that then i'll listen of course my business partners and 
oddly enough, I think over the last little while, my kids are the ones that most influence me because, you know, everything I do right now is really for them. And I don't mean that in a way where, you know, um, trying to pay for the college or university tuition. Mm -hmm. My motivation in what I'm doing is for their generation and for the next generation coming up. Uh, we yeah. have a responsibility as um, keepers of the current internet to make sure that they have uh, something when they uh, want to start their business up. It's uh, what's that saying? Um, we need to plant seeds for trees that will grow in which shades we will never sit under and what yeah. fruits we will never yeah. eat. Um and that's where the World Metaverse Council comes in. That's why I'm doing the things I'm doing. And, you know, for the people that I've influenced my life. Wow. Wonderful. A very, very well put as well, Daniel. I think uh, okay. I'm, I'm sure there'll be many who, uh, you know, associate with the, this kind of a thought. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. And uh, for all our uh, listeners and uh, audience, we do have, uh, the link to Daniel uh, right below this podcast. So please uh, look them up, follow, and uh, and also uh, uh, anyway, uh, come back for the next podcast wherein we are talking more about what exactly is the Metaverse Campus about and uh, uh, what's the vision behind it and uh, when is it getting launched. All those things we'll be talking about it soon. So you come back to that podcast and also do share with people so that uh, I think uh, uh, a lot of times uh, the very simplest of thoughts uh, gives you that, uh, it just gives you a nice pleasant light, right? That it just gives you a, a, mm-hmm. a good feel about it. So it, it's such a nice thing to, uh, uh, about this conversation as well. So. Uh, so please go ahead, share it, and uh, till we come back to the, with the next one, enjoy the ride. And Daniel, once again, thank you so much for thank you. sharing your journey with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.